In this video series, we're gonna build an insanely nice walnut table with a brass plated leg assembly and a high gloss urethane finish that I promise will make you smile. So seriously, join us because there's gonna be a lot of cool building techniques and I bet you'll learn a thing or two along the way. And maybe you'll learn a lot of things. To build this table, we're gonna be using some thick walnut. And by thick, I mean really thick, like 10 quarter and 12 quarter walnut. And the first step is finding those perfect boards for the tabletop, since the top is one of the most important pieces of a table. The customers wanted it to be modeled after the Hellman and Chang James dining table. So this isn't my design, but the customers wanted some specific details changed, like a solid wood top and a high gloss finish, since the Hellman and Chang model is actually a veneered top, which I totally understand why they do because there are going to be brass inlays and we'll get into that in the future. But for now, let's just focus on the walnut top. Since these are just rough sawn boards, we need to get them milled up so that we can actually see what we're working with. And Cody's really feeling the pain of shoving one of these giant things through the joiner, since I have the job of ripping them on the table saw. So you're probably thinking, why aren't you guys helping each other? And well, of course, because we're not smart enough. We haven't figured that out yet. Plus, I enjoy watching Cody struggle his way through the joiner. But I guess enough of that, because these things are just too darn big to handle with one person. And I don't realize it until the end of this cut, but I'm cutting way too much off this board because I forgot to reset the fence. And luckily this didn't impact the width of our table because each one of these boards costs a lot of money. So now we're cutting them to rough length before we mill the faces which by now we have a pretty good groove where the leading person ends up being the back person and then this keeps revolving over and over. And of course, you could spend a lot of time doing this with a hand plane as well. Or most lumber yards can mill the boards for you for an added charge if you don't want to send these things through a lunchbox planer. The walnut top will have a brass inlay along the breadboard end, but more importantly, there's a tenon that needs to be cut along the table side of the joint, and it's gonna save us some time later if we cut away some of that material now on each board. So with a quick test cut to confirm the correct depth, we can start hogging away material by putting the board on a sled and using the dado stack to cut the tenons. You absolutely don't have to do this step. I just figured at the time that it was a good idea to get rid of this material, but you could just rely on the router later. I've used this technique in the construction field before where I put a two by four on two of the roller stands that I have and using that as a sled for the other side of the board and it works pretty darn well. Even better than having someone hold the other side because then it eliminates the possibility of human error. Now you can see the long tabletop tenon come to shape. And don't forget to mark these because we wanna keep them in order. These do need one last pass on the joiner with the inside outside method because I can still fit a feeler gauge in some of the joints. So this pass is really light and making sure that that surface is perfect because now I literally can't even find the joint to put the feeler gauge in. The glue up is gonna be split up into several parts. Two boards on the right side, two boards on the left side, and one board in the middle left alone. The reason we're doing it this way is so that we can send the two separate glue ups through the planer after they're dry. And this will result in a much flatter tabletop serving us very well since this thing will be a high gloss finish. But you'll see in future clips that I actually end up taking a hand plane to the tabletop to flatten it. So you could just glue up the whole table as is right now, as long as you're at the correct final thickness that you want. These boards are milled a little bit thicker than the final thickness because they're gonna be sent back through the planer anyways. Another reason why I like doing these tops in multiple glue ups is the fresher the glue is, the easier it squeezes out and the better your joints will look and the best joint out there is a joint you can't see at all. And speaking of good joints, this joint on bottom had a live edge exposed, so I'm gonna fill it with some black epoxy since the final table will actually be stained black. A card scraper helps clean up the rest of the glue squeeze out before we send these things through the planer. Which, by the way, it's just a preference, but I really don't like how walnut looks on the sapwood side, so I always try to face that side down. The top side shown here looks so much better. 
and the joints came out amazing. And don't forget to mill that lonesome board down to final thickness too because these things are about to be attached, but not without jointing them first. Yep, we're going to be sending these huge things through the joiner. And since we learned our lesson and apparently two people are better than one, it actually wasn't that bad. And this thing is looking pretty freaking awesome. For this final glue up, I really prefer to use dominoes since we're not going to be able to send this thing through the planer again and we want everything to be perfectly level. For this glue up, it's important that we go as fast and efficient as possible because again, the faster we glue it up, the better the joints will look in the end. And luckily everything went smoothly because we're professionals and I could only hope we could pull off a two joint glue up, but that doesn't stop us from being proud. With clamping calls on the ends and a quick check of the middle, this thing's flat. And I'm exhausted. Now it's time to cut the long edges of the table straight and parallel to one another. If they aren't parallel, then the square cut I'm going to do next won't actually be square. And our final width is 48 inches. Now I can use a track with a track square to cut the tenons nice and straight. This will come in handy for the next step. This giant bit by Amana is going to be doing the final cutting of the tenons. The guide for the router is actually the board that will eventually be the breadboard end. A guide block positions it a perfect distance away from the end of the tenon, and that's why the tenon needs to be cut square and straight. So the guide board can be clamped down and an end block can also be clamped to reduce tear out. I only need to do one depth of pass since we pre-cut the tenons earlier on. But if you didn't pre-cut the tenons, I strongly suggest that you do several passes of different depths. And since we planned it so that this bit doesn't have much to cut, the cut is perfect and leaves a glass smooth finish. Just make sure whatever straight guide you're using is dead straight. Now with the board repositioned, we can cut the second pass on the outer edge of the tenon. And to make sure that the surface is perfectly even, a hard sanding block sands everything smooth. We're just making sure that whatever sanding we do is even across the whole tenon. Now the second tenon can be cut just like the first, and luckily there were no lessons to be learned, so we did it the exact same way. And yes, Cody got a little dirty. Another thing I haven't mentioned is how tight your board is against the tabletop because this will impact how straight the tenon is. Let's say hypothetically your tabletop is really cupped but your board is straight. When you run your router across it your tenon will be perfectly straight but your tabletop will be left cupped. We don't want that, we actually want the tenon to follow the natural variation of the tabletop. That way when the breadboard end goes on it actually flattens everything. Now the other side can be cut, but we need to make sure that it gets cut perfectly square to the last cut. Before this last cut though, I actually noticed that the tabletop is a little bit cupped. So I just add a shim in the middle and that raises that center. The full thickness of the top is two inches and each shoulder gets cut down to five eighths, leaving the tenon at three quarters. This follows the one third rule when you're dealing with tenons. This usually offers the most strength for the joint. And a final check confirms that they're perfectly square to one another. Now it's time to work on the breadboard ends and trust me, you're probably not gonna like how I cut the mortises. But before we get to that, I wanna do a test cut to check the fit. Then I can cut the breadboard ends to length and a quick run on the joiner since these have been sitting out for about a week. I cut mine even with the sides because it's summer and the top will shrink in the winter. Now this is where things get a little bit dicey because I'm actually doing a plunge cut on a dado stack, pressing a lot of force against a stop block so that the board doesn't go flying. This process was definitely a two man job and I honestly don't recommend it for your safety, but for us and our experience, we were comfortable with it. 
Now you can see the operation. Cody will unclamp the stop block as soon as I do the plunge. Then he will quickly scurry around to the other side so that he can help me put force against the fence. Keep in mind this is also a saw stop, thankfully. But we're not done yet because a second pass has to be made so that the mortise is a full two inches deep. And I'm sure this process could be done on a router table, but I feel like it would also be pretty unsafe. But all that unsafe shenanigans is worth it because look at that fit. Since the mortise in the breadboard end doesn't go all the way to the edge, neither can the tenon on the table. So it has to get cut to the same radius as the blade that we used. I'm taking into account expansion of the top so the tenon gets cut back an extra quarter inch in case the table ever gets shipped to somewhere humid like Florida. Upon first tests of this tenon, it is of course a little bit too tight, but that's what we want. Because now we can take those same hard sanding blocks and sand the tenon down so that it is nothing short of a perfect fit. And don't get me wrong, this is actually quite the process. This probably took an hour and a half just to fit this one tenon. But it's worth all of that time because we really need this joint to be as good as it possibly could be. And over time, we get closer and closer to that exact fit we need. And when you do this, you'll probably see just how satisfying this process is. And something that I didn't mention before is that the breadboards are left a little bit thicker than the top, that way they can get hand planed down later. And we need that buffer for this exact reason. And now it's time to commit and hammer the thing home. The breadboard is extra wide so that I can cut off the hammer marks later. My low angle jack plane is one of my favorites if I'm doing things like this because I know it won't cause tear out. I still feel like I have a lot of control, it cuts really well, and I know I'm not going to create big gashes in this expensive walnut top. This is one of those times in woodworking that you just want to put on some music and take your time and do a really, really good job. I'm tailoring everything including the shoulders so that everything fits absolutely perfectly as if I haven't already told you that. Now we can start on the other side. On this one I'm choosing to use my Stanley number 5 to take off the bulk of the material first then I'll refine with the low angle jack plane later followed by a flat sanding with 80 grit. I'm checking this top meticulously for flatness because this high gloss finish will show absolutely everything. And marking the high spots will make it easy for me to know where to hand plane later. I'm just using extremely light cuts, that way I don't go too far with it. And I have to admit, I never thought there would come a day that I would actually hand plane a tabletop that I would later put a high gloss finish on. I just never thought I would have enough experience to pull something like that off. But I guess practice does make perfect and patience really is a virtue. I'm making sure to check the top as I go, both across the width and across the length. Then when my OCD gives me the go ahead, I can sand the whole thing with 80 grit to get rid of any planar marks. Because in case I haven't mentioned it before, this thing needs to be perfectly flat. And you might have asked yourself, how in the world does he get the breadboard ends back off? And honestly, it took me a minute, but clamping two sanding blocks to the board and hammering it back off actually works great. The sanding blocks protect the board from being damaged because if the clamp was just directly clamped to the board, then the wood would probably get bruised. <sighs> and unfortunately, I'm about to really screw up. Right now, I'm routing a groove down the entire width of the tabletop for a brass inlay, and I don't know if you can see the problem with this, but I'm about to have a pretty sad realization. You know what I just realized? No, Corey, what did you just realize? I can't do the inlay on the table side because that has to expand and contract. So it has to be on the breadboard end. So I'm gonna have to cut, <clears throat> basically cut the tenon further. So I guess it's not the end of the world because I could just cut the tenon back further and luckily I left extra width to the breadboard ends so there was actually no change to the overall length of the table since the customers do want a 120 inch table, not 119 and three quarters. 
But anyways, now the grooves can be routed into the breadboard ends since expansion won't cause problems there. I'm just making sure to use blocks so that I don't get tear out. And in case you're lost, there will eventually be a brass inlay across the top and the side, but not on the bottom because that would be wasted material and labor. Now Cody can give the top an 80 grit sanding while I whack the ends back on. Only that the underside hasn't been leveled and I wanted to give Cody a chance to do it himself. And I'm glad I did because Cody did an amazing job and that means you could too. Especially since this is his first time picking up a hand plane and he's planing a very expensive table. And I am having him check flatness probably more often than he needs to, but I just want to really make sure that he doesn't go too far in one area. And I really almost can't believe it. I'll say it again, he did an amazing job. He actually pulled off every step exactly like I would do it or a professional would do it. And by the time he finishes the second side, he's a freaking pro. Who hired this guy? And there's the finished bottom. And that concludes this first video of the series. And in the next one, we will unfortunately uncover some problems with epoxy and brass. Oh no. And continue the satisfying process of building a designer walnut table. Please subscribe by clicking the left icon, check out all of our awesome build videos, and here's another unique video to watch.